Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're gonna take a look at Canada and see how this crisis is affecting them, as well as the top five reasons that Cannabis 2.0 sales might disappoint. To help us do that is Katrina Glogowski. She's an angel investor and attorney in Seattle. Katrina, thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. And everybody knows I love Canada. Oh yeah. Can't get across the border yet though, still closed. Yeah, my fingers are crossed. <laughs> so Canada's a lot like the U.S. Uh, they've had their stay-at-home orders that took effect. And so online orders surged from 5,000 in mid-March to 9,000 by mid-April, according to estimates from Cannabis Benchmarks. And sales reached $216 million in March, more than triple the monthly total in the previous year. So just like consumer staples, both products historically have strong sales in times of economic weakness. For instance, alcohol consumption increased 7.2% in 2008, 2009, even as consumer discretionary spending fell 9.3% over the same time frame. And we've done a podcast in the past about vice stocks or send stocks and how well they do inversely during economic corrections. And I think gambling was like 118% up during those that same time period as well. So uh, edibles are soaring. That stay at home, uh, work from home stuff has got people either trying new things or maybe instead of the topicals they're going to the edibles. Uh, what's your take? This is perfectly logical to me, Josh. You are stuck at home in a situation which you may or may not be used to having to deal with pressures and concerns that you may or may not be used to. Uh, God bless the children of the world, but uh, used to be able to pawn them off on the childcare system called the public school <laughs> organizations, uh, and now you're stuck with them. Uh, and you can't hit them, you can't kill them, so <laughs> it makes sense to sort of medicate your way through. And I'm very glad that people have the option of cannabis and CBD as opposed to alcohol. Uh, we all know the difference of the effects between the two. So it doesn't surprise me at all. And then you take the traditional sin stock upticks that you re referenced earlier, Josh, and it makes perfect sense to me. And Canada is a perfect example because they allow delivery. Uh, we're sitting here in Washington State where delivery is still... Uh, up in the air, still tricky. Uh, the fact that Canada had an established medical marijuana delivery system prior to this debacle uh, allowed them just to take advantage of it because it was already set up. So makes perfect sense to me. So another contributing factor for the acceleration in products is obviously the addition of new um new products with 2.0. They were only able in Canada to have flour and pre-rolls. Now they can have uh, other products like beverages and edibles, vapes, other things that appeal to a wider uh, consumer base. So at the end of Q1 2020, we saw that Ontario only had 52 cannabis dispensaries. So to your point about delivery, when you only have four dispensaries per a million people, compare that to 180 stores per million in Colorado, how else are you going to get the product to them unless you deliver it? That's a really slow rollout. Agreed. Ontario struggled mightily with cannabis, period. Yeah. So there's obviously a robust demand. Canada and the U.S. have been declared essential services allowing for the continuation during this crisis. So in the U.S., the economic downturn can accelerate efforts to find new sources of economic stimulus and tax revenue, legalizing and taxing recreational cannabis is one way that states could pursue a track record to generate economic growth and taxes. And those taxes and economic growth could particularly be welcome given the stalling economic growth and swelling debt caused by the crisis. So could this be a fast track to legalization after printing trillions of dollars? How else are you going to get the revenue? Well, <laughs> I think, Josh, you have been predicting this for a while. Federal legalization of cannabis is going to require... Uh, a motivation for it. And taxation is certainly a motivation for it. Absolutely. And to getting your point about edibles and the, and the big upswing in edibles also makes perfect sense. When you are at home, you sm smoking a joint, smoking a flower or pre-roll, guess what? It stinks. Uh, and uh, a lot of rental units don't allow smoking. 
so the edibles, the uptick in edibles is again, perfectly logical. Yeah, and I saw from, I think it was headset report. We'll cover that later on uh, next week. But I, I believe that topicals decreased in sales, which I find interesting. Maybe it, there's less people working and so there's less pain or there's less stress because you're working from home or is it just a substitute to edibles? I don't really know, but I find it interesting that topicals are decreasing and edibles are increasing. I think there's some, uh, some data to the dive into eventually. Well, but, when your knee hurts, you can rub a salve on your knee. Uh, but if you're not driving, you're not going anywhere, why don't you just use the anti-inflammatory anti nature of the product in itself for your whole system? Mm -hmm. uh, it, again, this is logical to me. It makes sense. Um, you know, it, it helps your elbow and your knee as far as uh, the purported anti-inflammatory effects. So the edibles taking off versus the creams and the salves going down in the patches, perfect sense. So before we get into the, some of the reasons why the sales might disappoint in Canada, looking at how British Columbia reported an all-time high in tax revenue. So it looks like in December, the province experienced an all-time high in tax revenue since legalization in 2018. It reached $2.5 million. That's a 44% increase compared to the previous month, almost doubling November's tax collection from the cannabis industry. So between October and December of 2019, they had 80 new cannabis stores. So there's still been a really slow rollout from Ontario to Vancouver, BC, but sales are finally starting to come up. Let's take a look at uh, some of the reasons why it might disappoint in the end. According to The Motley Fool, there are five reasons why cannabis 2.0 sales might disappoint. Number one is that they're an adequate retail footprint, especially in Ontario. So despite 38% of Canada's residents living in Ontario, only a little over four dozen dispensaries were open. So there's obviously not enough uh, dispensaries, but they do have delivery. <clears throat> so that could be one of the reasons why cannabis sales disappoint. How much of an impact do you think that's going to have? If a customer cannot purchase the product, either due to a lack of retail outlet or supply, the sales won't be there. The, they just won't be there. And Ontario is a case study of the failure of cannabis legalization. Uh, they, they cranked it down so hard that it was almost impossible, even though cannabis has been legalized in uh, Canada for years, it, they still struggle to, to make a legal purchase in Ontario. They got to figure it out. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, again Cannabis 2.0 sales disappointing. Where can I buy it? Where? Especially if you live in Toronto uh, and then co contrast that with Vancouver, Canada, where it's relatively easy to get. And uh, you saw the, the slide about the massive increase in revenue, uh, tax revenue in BC. That's because people can buy it legally safely and conveniently. Ontario is an epic failure here. Yeah, we were up in Canada not too long ago and you went into what you thought was a dispensary and it was completely illegal, I think. That was according to, to our friend up there. I went into one knowing it was not legal because there wasn't any legal options. So yeah, they got to figure it out. They were anticipating 250 dispensaries that would be open by the end of this year, but that's not a guarantee because of the crisis. So they don't have a real adequate legal retail network. It's difficult for licensed producers to get that high margin product in front of customers, which is another reason why sales might disappoint. Right. Uh, and as far as Vancouver, I mean, that was the whole medical uh, recreational transition debacle that uh, I've used the word debacle several times now uh, that plagued the BC legalization uh, for, for some time. Uh, and again, you have to be able to get it somewhere. The, the, the average consumer, uh, I call her the soccer mom, uh, wants to do the right thing. She wants to buy it legally. She wants to buy it safely. And if she can't, she won't. So there you go. 
So even if you wanted to go into a store, you can't. So this crisis has halted in-store purchases, making it difficult for places like Washington that um, some of the stores, 23% of the stores I visited on 420 didn't have that as an option. So um, pretty crazy. So you have most retail locations still open in the capacity that they can provide curbside pickup or delivery, but no customers are allowed inside dispensaries to browse the cases in most uh, most places. So in the view of the Montley Fool, they think this is liable to reduce the average ticket price to consumers since fewer discretionary purchases are being made and because it's much tougher for dispensaries to introduce uh, the customers to a newly launched derivative. I think that's true and that's one of the possible reasons that sales might falter following this this current phase that we're in because you have to know what you want. If you're going to order online or place an order for delivery, you have to sort of have an idea of, of what it is you're looking for. And a lot of these websites that are, you know, online menus are not very sophisticated and it can be hard to find a product. And of course, you're not standing there in the store itself, waiting in line and making that impulse purchase just like the grocery store model of putting the, the cold soda and the candies right there by the checkout to, to increase the dollar amount of your purchase. So we might see struggles like that uh, if, if this phase continues. So initially I thought, well, I don't know because California is buying a lot more. So they have a minimum order, I think of $60, but they're like doubling that. I think the average person is spending about 120. And I don't know if that's because they're at home all of the time or they're not working or they want to try new things or what the deal is. But then looking at the numbers that come through uh, with headset that just had their month over month sales data, we can see year over year um, it's declining. So uh, it was only 42% sales growth in California. So that's a 35% decrease from April. You can see the drop in Colorado, a huge drop in Nevada. And then check this out. Washington is like relatively flat. We actually had an increase. It's the only place that had an increase. So I'm actually kind of changing my tune on Washington. I've been telling everyone, stay the hell out of Washington. It's a terrible place to do business. But when there's a, a crisis, Washington sales don't change that much by comparison. What I would really focus on this chart, Josh, is the difference between Colorado and Washington, because both of them are fairly mature markets. Why there is a massive crash in Colorado, I can't say, except for the fact that Colorado has verticalization. Uh, uh, Farmer Bob can grow it package it and put it out in a stand in Colorado. In Washington, there's no verticalization. And so the the supply streams, the retail streams are pretty set. Uh, At this point, the market is mature enough. You know the store you're gonna go to. You go to the same store over and over again. And they usually have the same, if not similar products over and over again. So if you run into uh, a supply chain issue because of illness, you can always get another product. Uh, When you go to Farmer Bob and and somewhere in the supply chain at Farmer Bob in Colorado, uh, you're not gonna be able to buy that anymore. Now, of course, Colorado has big retailers that that, uh, are not relying on Farmer Bob, but I don't know how to explain the, the, the crash in the Colorado market any other way except for a, a blip in the supply chain. I'm guessing it has to do with, uh, with tourism. I know Nevada just got absolutely decimated with the lack of, of tourism. Clark County in, um, in Vegas is 80% of all sales in the entire state of Nevada. And without casinos and tourism, they got hammered. Colorado, I was surprised to see the dip. I thought that they would be more like Washington, more stable, but they seem to be relying on a lot more tourism than we are. And when you see the average basket amount, the average basket amount or how much people go in and actually buy is increasing. Um, And so 
maybe when looking at year over year, the sales are going down, but when people are going in, they're paying more money. So to my point about California paying more, that's an uptick of a, almost 12% um, from May going in and how much they're buying. Colorado's up almost 5%. Nevada's up like 50% on how much people they're buying. Uh, and Seattle, they're only up 7.77%. Nice little lucky number, but it's, it's relatively flat. Like we're kind of this normal market that doesn't really move much as long as we know that it's an essential business. We hoarded just like everybody else until it was declared essential. Right. Uh, well, this, this also can be explained when, when your trips outside are limited, it, you're not going to go every day. Uh, you're you're going to go uh, maybe once a week or once a month. So that explains the, the average basket size going up. And in, in Seattle, we, ha we have a fairly easy access where you can still walk. Uh, the buses are still running. Uh, and uh, not saying that you can't walk to your, to your uh, retailer in, in some of these other states, but Seattle, we're, we're fairly dense and there's a store fairly close to you. Uh, and you can walk, you can go several times a week uh, and you don't have to get in the car and Maybe that explains the flat nature of, of Washington sales compared to some of the other states that we're going. But that would be an interesting study. Somebody should figure out why. Yeah, it's interesting. So looking at number three on the top five reasons why cannabis 2.0 sales might disappoint, you're looking at Alberta and Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador all banning vape pens. So we saw that Alberta ban vape pens between mid-December and mid-February, but Quebec, Newfoundland, and Labrador still have those bans in effect today. And those bans could especially hurt Kronos Group, which landed an equity investment from tobacco giant Altria Group back in March of 2019. So it depends on how conservative it is, right? I mean, in Arizona, it's a huge part of that community. They don't buy pre-rolls at all. They buy a lot of things that are discreet. So I don't know about some of these areas um, in Canada, but if they are conservative or they like convenience and discreetness, this is going to be a huge uh, you know, lack of sales or, or potential uh, where we've seen a huge amount of sales in, in North America, U.S., medical and, and recreational. Well, I have two comments to that, Josh. The first is that might explain the uptick in edibles if you have a ban on vape pens, because again, <laughs> uh, we've talked about you know the smell of marijuana and people you know are are prohibited from combusting uh, materials uh, in a lot of their living situations. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might explain some of that. But as far as uh, a flat out ban on vape pens. Uh, Washington struggled with this, with the whole uh, vitamin E thing uh, in, in the contamination. And then they sort of settled back down into an acceptable uh, vape pen formulation uh, and ingredients situation. So uh, I hope that Canada comes to their senses concerning vape pens. Uh, they certainly should be regulated. They certainly should uh, not have extraneous ingredients like pesticides. Uh, and uh, they'll figure it out. But if they don't, you are correct. It's going to do long-term damage to the market because people do not want to stink. They just don't. And of course, they're prohibited from smoking uh, a pre-roll uh, in probably 95% of the places where they're located. So number four on the list is probably the meat and potatoes, this whole thing on five reasons why cannabis 2.0 sales in Canada might fail. And that's because of the balance sheet constraints. So some part of the blame for the wheat cannabis 2.0 launch likely lies with the licensed producers wh whose balance sheets are an absolute mess. So at this time last year, pot stocks appeared to have plenty of capital and or relatively easy access to financing. And that's just not the case anymore with practically every grower in Canada halting construction on remaining projects or idling assets to conserve capital. In other words, the, the full bore production that Wall Street and pot stock investors were counting on last year simply isn't going to come to fruition. For example, Hexo was expected to focus heavily on derivative products 
and yield 150,000 kilos of equivalent output each year at its peak. And instead, it laid off 200 workers, completely shut down its Niagara facility. That was acquired via the New Strike brand acquisition and has been forced to sell its common stock on a number of occasions in recent months to raise capital. So Hexo is being sued by extraction service provider Metafarm Labs over allegations it did make a payment. And Hexo is taking write downs on a portion of its inventory. So we've seen a lot of write offs, a lot of people liquidating, sell lease back options, all these things to get some capital. Balance sheets are just not properly uh, put together. We can see from going way back, deals that were put in place that weren't really generating revenue, and all of this is kind of coming uh, to a head where you're looking at valuation like, what am I investing in? We've been talking about this for a little while uh, on this podcast, Josh, where uh, finances are important and you need to get your cost of goods sold under control. If you don't, you're going to fail. And now when you have billions and billions and billions of dollars invested in your company, you're not necessarily watching the bottom line. Oh, hey, we're going to just launch into gummies chocolates, vape pens, sodas, creams. No, you got to research the market. You have to actually pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, And Cannabis 2.0 in Canada gave a once in a lifetime opportunity for people to capitalize on an entirely new market. And some of them did it well, and some of them did not. And that is what you're looking at. Uh, and while you can pull up Hexo as a failure, you can also look at Manitoba Harvest that is doing fairly well. Well, so that leads us to number five, the top five reasons why cannabis 2.0 sales in Canada might fail is the weather. So consumers are less willing to go out when it's cold, wet, or snowing outside, making it more likely that we see some initial weakness in Canada 2.0 sales as a result of the timing of when they were launched. I'm not sure if it's the weather and people won't go out and buy. I mean, they have delivery, but I would say that the weather could be an issue if a lot of these producers decide to switch from indoor to outdoor. North America is not the spot to grow. Canada is not going to be the best terroir and, and place to 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 cultivate. Um, I think some of the issues that we're going to see based on the pitch deck that we did a couple of weeks ago, there's a Nevada producer that is claiming to be able to grow at, I think, 44 cents. And a lot of these, these LPs in Canada are doing it at $1.50, $1.50 a gram. And so, I mean, if you can do it for a third of the cost, your weather is not going to help you out. Weather is not going to, it's going to be an issue because of the climate You can't grow the same as somebody in like California, for example. I agree with your statements relating to production of of the raw materials, Uh, but the weather does not, did not, and will not ever affect cannabis sales in Canada. In Canada, thanks to federal legalization, pay attention United States, uh, you can get your cannabis Through the mail, Canada Post is the biggest shipper of cannabis in the country. You just put it in an envelope and mail it. So you're telling me that snow and rain prohibited delivery of Canada Post. That's the U.S. mail system equivalent in Canada. No, that's not true. That is just simply not true. And uh, so I hope that this uh, five reasons why uh, cannabis 2.0 sales are going to disappoint, don't, don't rely on the weather as an excuse to prohibiting purchase. That, that's just not true. And it shows a um, lack of understanding of, of the market that they're talking about. Uh, however, if they are talking about production, you are absolutely correct. Uh, nobody is going to grow cannabis outside in Saskatchewan. Uh, it, it's just not going to happen because of the cost of goods sold. We'll, we'll see. Uh, the weather. Uh, <laughs> uh, the we weather. will see. You're going to have to come back to the talking hedge and find out. So with that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. I want to thank my guest, Katrina Glogowski, angel investor and attorney in Seattle. Thanks for being back on the podcast, Katrina. Thanks, Josh. I am Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out. 
to check out these other videos that we've got.